Hi, this is an update on my Lato Panda review where I tackle the overheating problem and take a look at power supply and network performance testing. So, I have a new guy on work experience. He wants to be a grip. Isn't that right, Mick? Oh, uh, sorry. What were you doing? I was just checking the lights. Can you just get a grip? A number of you have asked questions in the comment section. I've assumed that since it's a public comment that you don't mind me highlighting your questions. First of all, let's check out what the minimum supply voltage is that we can get away with. My bench power supply is capable of adjusting the maximum current, so I set it to 4 amps as a start and booted it up. The peak current that displayed was around 1.2 amps, but it's not a real indication of peak current, so I wound it down to 3 amps and rebooted which came up with around the same peak current. So what about 2 amps? Well it booted, but can't really say if it would get any further, especially if you load the USB bus down. So then let's try 1.5 amps. Seemed to start well, but wouldn't even get past first base, and kept shutting off. So it would seem that 2 amps is the absolute minimum to boot up, but once the USB buses are loaded, it would probably shut down. I would stick with a 3 amp supply to be sure. You may have noticed that I set the power supply to 5.1 volts, there's a good reason for this. If you are ever having issues with charging or powering devices, be careful of which cable you use. Essentially, the thinner the wire, the less it is able to carry a current. So for the standard AWG18 cable, I would expect a 0.1 volt drop. To put it into perspective, I used a cheap USB cable to power up the Lato Panda. I kept the supply at 5.1 volts and tried to power it up, with the same expected results, just bombs out. If we go back to our calculations and update for this cable, you can see we have a 0.3 voltage drop. So, cable quality matters. Another thing to note is that just plugging it in and powered off, it will draw about 1. amps for about 8 seconds, and then drop down to 80 milliamps, which is probably just the Atmega. Next onto this CPU throttling problem, I wonder what sort of cooling method is adequate enough. So I downloaded the open hardware monitor, which gives you everything you need, even when idle, it's running red hot. Well, as idle as Windows can ever get. I fired up GFX Bench and checked on both current draw and temperature and loading. This was just a stock Lato Panda in a case, nothing fancy. The results were the same as last time. Pretty bad, but as Julius Solno Millers used to say, why is this so? Well, the answer is in the data. Even though the CPU was 100% loaded, you can see that because the CPU could boil an egg for you, the CPU clock rate was throttled, kept at a little over 400 MHz for the whole test. Man, that's bad. Running Geekbench 4 had the same result as last time. But check out the results. Once again, even though the CPU was 100% for most of the time, the high temperature was throttling the CPU. Under Linux, it was a similar story, although the CPU wasn't being throttled as much under a basic CPU stress test. So, what can I do about this? Well, I can go completely overboard and use a desktop CPU heatsink and fan unit. This has a chunky bit of copper that will unquestionably draw any heat away from the Lato Panda CPU. Even though this is a 12 volt fan, it'll still work under 5 volts. And it only drew 100 milliamps by itself. Adding electrical tape is kind of important, since I'll be putting a large bit of conductive metal in a place it normally wouldn't be. And carefully lined up the thick bit of copper to rest on both chips. If you do this yourself, make sure it's placed firmly. Any air gaps can lead to overheating. The weight of the heatsink keeps it firmly in place, just for testing. Next, connect up the Lato Panda and power on. You can see already how much of a difference it makes, going from 80 degrees Celsius to 32 degrees Celsius. Nice. This is all well and good, but how does this translate to a real world situation? Time for GFX Bench again. Holy cow, Batman. Is this the same board that I tested last time? Everything is smooth and no jerkies. This is the way the Lato Panda should have been. A better designed heatsink would have solved a lot of the problems for everyone. Comparing the difference between massive fan and stock board, you can see that on average it's 2.3 times faster. Nice! You can see from the thermal graphs that the temperature is kept low and so the CPU clock remains high. And a side effect is that the CPU is actually underutilized. Running a Ferronix CPU stress test under Linux showed a marked improvement as well. So this is a great result, but frankly having a humongous heatsink attached sort of kills the small size advantage. 
So let's try out how it goes with DF Robot's supplied heatsinks, which are a little too small, I think. The temperature jumped back up, but not as much as just the small bit of metal. Running GFX Bench again showed that big heatsinks make a difference, dropping down to 1.6 times the stock board. Once again, temperature high, and the CPU is starting to throttle to blazes again. Next I added a small fan to hopefully cool things down a bit, and waited until the temperature levelled out. Then hammered it again with the GFX bench test. This time round it improved slightly, seeing an average of 1.9 times improvement over the stock board. So if you want to see the most performance out of this board, then get a decent heatsink and fan. It'll also last a lot longer. Moving on to HDMI audio, Lazy Bunny first mentioned that HDMI audio was actually working. But for some reason, it wasn't for me. It never came up as an audio device. It seems that my Elgato HD6 1080p HDMI recorder is having problems passing through HDMI audio. Odd, as it was working before. So, back to directly connecting it to my display and using a camera to record it all. Focus on electronics. <laughs> yep, works okay. But of course, still not working under Linux. Nita wanted to know whether or not Wi-Fi or BLE was working under Linux. However, it didn't work for me under Debian. There's a great post on the Latte Panda forum where someone has managed to get Wi-Fi going, which is a simple matter of fetching the firmware and modifying the BIOS settings, but I'll need to revisit this as it wasn't working for me. Next onto testing a Bluetooth keyboard under Windows. Ah, uh, yeah, no problems there. Next onto testing Wi-Fi, I installed iPerf, which is a great cross-platform network benchmarking tool. I first tried out a decent aerial instead of the supplied one connected it to my access point, which was in the next room, and ran the iPerf benchmark. On UDP, I was getting around 2.4 milliseconds jitter and 1.5% packet loss, and around 23 megabits per second on TCP, which is pretty good. Next, to use the supplied aerial to see how it goes. On UDP, the packet loss increased to around 2.3%, and so did the jitter at 3.2 milliseconds, whilst TCP came up with the same 23 megabits per second. So all in all, a pretty decent aerial for what it is. What's it like with no aerial? UDP jitter increased to over 11 milliseconds with a 2.8% packet loss, and it dropped down to 10 megabits per second on TCP tests. This is to be expected, so make sure you at least use the supplied aerial. Moving on to Ethernet performance. I saw a decent 93 megabits per second under TCP, pretty close to 100 megabits, and not many boards this cheap can do this. Next, I tested the local loopback network Interestingly, this was pretty slow, coming in at under 800 megabits per second. I would have expected much better than that. To put it in perspective, my Mac Mini can reach almost 20 gigabits per second. Most modern PCs should be hitting that mark. One of my Raspberry Pi 2s was hitting 1.7 gigabits per second. Next, I wanted to see if I could boot from SD, so I installed Debian Linux onto the SD card. The install went through without issue. However, the BIOS didn't even scan the SD card slot for a UEFI boot loader. So you're stuck with using USB and eMMC boot for now, until they update the BIOS. So going back to my original MicMac score of 3.5, do I need to update it? Well, I'd now give it a score of 4.0 out of 5. It does everything as advertised, but the overheating is a real problem. If you can get your hands on a decent heatsink, then this board is pretty powerful. So that's about it for this review. If you enjoyed this video, then don't forget to hit like. And if the annotations do actually appear, you can click on these buttons to subscribe or follow me on social networks. A big shout out to all my supporters on Patreon who are helping me help you. If you'd like to support me, you can click on the card up here. Thanks for watching and see you next week.